A lot of people identify you as the first black male to own, uh, of the first black person really to own a car manufacturing company. But um, I know you, you, you've corrected people many times. So, um, you know, let, let's pay some homage before we get started. So who is the first black male uh, person to start a car manufacturing company and, and what, what, what have you gained from um, looking into their story? Oh, well, uh, in the U.S., um, uh, it was a, uh, a gentleman named by the name of C.R. Patterson, C.R. Patterson and Sons. You know, the father was a carriage maker, and then basically the son kind of like took over and expended, extended that business into making vehicles. So you know, he was out around the same time as Henry Ford. You know, and it's the same. It's the same story. Uh, I think he was known as a better, as a better craftsman. He actually had a, a better product. You know, by all accounts. But, uh, you know, he was African-American. And so he uh, wasn't able to get the capital that he needed. You know, it's funny that uh, you being from Haiti, the Haitian government actually tried to do a deal with C.R. Patterson to help him, like, get over uh, the hurdle. But, uh, you know, there are always roadblocks uh, in our way. And so, you know, the established banks and everyone was able to stop you know, his growth, you know, through various, you know, tactics that have been used over the years. But, but yeah, but there have always been black entrepreneurs out there. There have always been people in our community uh, willing to help, but simply not enough people willing to help. Because if we actually all got together and operated as a, a single black unit, then all entrepreneurs could get a little bit further. But, but C.R. Patterson is the man. He was the man. He's certainly a better car builder, you know, than I'll ever be. You know, so hopefully I'm a better businessman. Uh, I'm not so much of a car builder as I am a businessman. So hopefully, you know, I'll do some new tricks, get over the, get over the hump. Yes, sir. And um, I was reading about C. C. R. Patterson, and um, a lot of people said he was uh, he started before Henry Ford actually, and um, you know, Henry yeah, because Ford he was, was making name. carriages before he made cars. And I yeah. actually, uh, when I first moved to Atlanta, you know, everyone was calling me this whole first black thing. And so I actually put out a magazine. Uh, I created a magazine like to tell that story. And I actually tracked down his great grandson. So his, his great grandson is alive. And um, and so we included him in the story. And and uh, to me, I think that's that's, uh, you know, this kind of things the way we should go about a thing. The whole like first thing I'm not a fan of because it makes it seem like uh you know, it's only five or six black people doing something in the whole world. <laughs> actually, you know, I agree with you. Actually, there's so many brothers doing so many great things. This whole first, second, third thing, it's just, you know, it's not, I'm not a fan of it, but, you know, I appreciate the uh, recognition. And, you know, we're not a huge car company yet. I'm just like C.R. Patterson. You know, we're just going to see if we can make it over that hurdle. You mentioned that the engine was the, one, the thing that started it all. So what exactly is unique about the engine at Derrick Automotive and um, that separates it from other, you know, engines? Yeah, so our engine uh, is called a counterpoise engine. Uh, so the engine, it's actually, actually, it's a funny story with the engine. So my partner, Dell, uh, uh, he had a, a dream about an engine. So he wakes up, oh, I had this dream. Uh, you know, he's very religious. So he thinks that, you know, it was a revelation. And so uh, he has this engine design. This engine spins like an like an airplane engine. You know the 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 bore and the crankshaft spin in opposite directions. And, and so as we develop it and we take it to Cal Poly, which is a big engineering school in California, and so the professor looks at it and he says, "Oh, it looks like you guys fix the Siemens Housky engine." And we're looking at each other. What the hell is a Siemens Housky engine? Uh, the Siemens Housky engine was an engine that was developed in Germany. Uh, it was developed for the Luftwaffe uh, during World War II. Uh, but the, the the crankshaft spent faster than the bore, and so the engine didn't work. And so by changing these angles uh, and, and math inside the engine, we, we, we fixed that problem. So the, the engine that the Germans thought would win Hitler the war is actually the engine that we have now. So now it's called a counterpoise engine. And so the engine, 
does a, a complete engine cycle in half the time of a normal engine. So if I build something with four cylinders, you get two power strokes. So it, it performs like an eight cylinder. Now, an eight cylinder engine may weigh 800 pounds, where a four cylinder engine might only weigh 250 pounds and size and weight matter. So you have a smaller engine that uses less fuel that gives you more power. Right. And so then we were going to take that engine and put it with our generator uh, and use gas to recharge our electric cars. And that's how we figured we could get that car that would do that 700 to 1,000 miles or whatever. So we would put a charger basically inside of the car, still using fuel, but you would use about 80% less fuel to get the distance. So basically, it's a hybrid using a more efficient engine. That's all it is. So it's not as complicated as, as it sounds. It's really a pretty simple idea. But again, so we have that engine. I don't know if you... If, if you look at my social media, you'll see we have it inside one of my little 50 uh, mile trucks. But to actually put that engine into production, it's going to cost us another 18 million. <laughs> you see what I mean? So it's like you always need money. You always need money. You always need money. It's it, it, it's a never ending struggle for truth and justice. I tell you, you know, it's, it's insane. This whole thing is insane. Yeah, so when you see these guys getting these big checks for a billion dollars, two billion, ten billion, they need that money. It's just that it's not many people handing out ten billion dollar checks to brothers. You know what I mean? So, you know, we have to take the hard road. Yeah, we have to take the hard road. But one day I'm going to go to the bank by myself. I'm crying by myself now, but I think in 2025, 2025, you know, we're going to be at the bank by ourselves. So it's going to be all right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So uh, one of the things you mentioned too, like, you know, when you're learning about cars, you're finding out like at some point, like the, the cars are going to fail, like something's going to happen to it and it's going to break down. Electric cars work a little bit differently and things like that. But you're creating a a, a machine that um, you said is using 80 percent uh, better fuel and you're getting more mileage and things like that. What is the benefit of creating something like that that is going to be a cheaper product where you mentioned, you know, about capitalism and, you know, it's a carnival, carnival, carnivorous thing and um, you're trying to do it a little different. Yeah, what I was going for there was uh, not really uh, cheaper, but convenience. I know me, I make electric cars. I have electric cars. I don't even like to drive my own electric car because I don't want to invest the time in having to stop and charge it. So having a little gas engine uh, that would recharge the car just seems to me like a better idea because as a consumer, the only thing that changes is instead of stopping to get 15 gallons of gas, now I'm going to stop and get three or four gallons of gas. And so what what we what we're really creating is just a bigger, better Prius. You know, the Prius is 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 what's called a a, a parallel hybrid. The engine and the battery drives the car. You know, they take turns. All I'm doing is is a is a, is, a, is is my engine never drives the car. All it does is make electricity to recharge the battery, you know, so that's all we're doing. It's not as complicated as it would seem, but we were just hoping that consumers would choose that convenience. And now by bringing it down to a utility truck, that's just going to be used around airport terminals and campuses and in tourist areas, uh, that convenience of that utility vehicle being able to operate all day without you having to stop and charge it, Hopefully, you know, that would give us some competitive advantage and allow us to be able to sell these vehicles. So, you know, not not guaranteed to work, but that's the strategy. What makes you able to sell it at such cheap cost? And then um, what does repairs and, um, you know, things, fixes look like over time with something because like that? There's nothing in an electric car. I think people don't realize just because you pay a hundred and twenty something thousand for a Tesla doesn't mean it's worth it. <laughs> you know, electric car is, is very simple to make. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a toaster on wheels. So the component, the, the most expensive thing is the battery. Uh, you know, generators can be made uh, relatively inexpensively. And, and if a car is only doing 50 miles hour maximum, this is a very inexpensive vehicle to make. So don't forget a lot of what you pay for cars is marketing, you know, a lot of these cars are built for a few thousand bucks, but they're sold to you for a lot. So I'm not giving away anybody's uh, pricing formulas or anything, but electric cars really don't break. 
outside of the battery system going bad. You know, generators don't break. You see Teslas, you almost never have to put brakes on them because as soon as you take your foot off the gas, the car stops anyway, so you don't really have to brake. So it's a much simpler machine. And I think as people get rid of the charging problem, electric cars are really going to uh, take off. So we're, we're not going to be able to compete with Tesla and BYD and all these kind of guys. I mean, even Lucid uh, and Canoe and these companies that raise billions, if they hadn't been saved in different ways, they would all be out of business already. Uh, uh, so, so many of these guys have gone down already, even with billions of dollars, and they're already out of business. So, so the, the fact that we kept costs low, uh, stay in little niches, you know, I'm, I'm I'm trying to give us time to grow, time to accumulate more capital, time for some of my other technologies to work so that I have a portfolio of companies and then we can start to share capital across that portfolio of companies. And then maybe we can, you know, find our way into some, uh, you know, new place. Got it. Got it. Got it. Uh, so can you walk us through like the products? I know you mentioned the scooter, you mentioned the truck, like what the differences in the products are and, um, I know you had people investing, um, uh, pre-ordering and things like that. Um, what, what, what does it take necessarily yeah, for so, you to get? So, so the, the, the pre-order thing was, was designed is we always, uh, trying to be on a march to doing some type of uh, public offering. Right. And so to be on an exchange, you have different qualifications among those is a certain sales criteria, which is around 10 million. And so we tried to do the pre-orders so that when people use their pre-order certificates, we would hit that 10 million and then that would be one box that we could check. Right. And so right now we want to do uh, low speed, low speed trucks for local delivery and campuses and things like that, picking up trash, you know, security guards can drive them around a the Walmart parking lot instead of freezing in that golf cart. He could have like a little truck that's got heating and air in it. You see what I mean? And then we have, uh, you know, these cool electric bikes, which I think the biggest one is going to be that sidecar bike. We're going to be using those on our electric delivery app as well. So you're going to see uh, in January, we're going to announce that now we have an all electric delivery app. So it's DoorDash, but everything that comes to you is going to be delivered on an electric drivetrain. So that's the promise, right? So it's creating a market for our bikes. So you know, it's a it's kind of like a two sided strategy. You can compete for business or you can create your own customer base. And so I'm trying to create my own customer base. So I'll be making it with this hand and then selling it to another company that I own on the other hand. So that's kind of like what we're uh, doing there. So just right now, we're going to focus on the low speed trucks and these bikes. As my photonic technology takes off, which we have some really, really, really big deals that we think we can close here real soon. And then uh, we'd probably have some capital to go back and maybe really introduce a car. Uh, and I'm not sure I'm going to introduce a car in the US, but we probably are going to introduce a car in Africa, probably uh, in Ghana or Cameroon first. Uh, so we're going to go international this year for certain. Um, you know, you have to go where, where, where the markets are less developed. Yeah, we're small. Yeah, we're small, we're undercapitalized, so we have to go where we can be more competitive. Which is not unlike what I did when I was going to Cambodia. You know, it's kind of like you go back to these undeveloped markets and we could be a big fish in a little pond. And then, you know, but Africa is that next great economy. So if we can get in now, uh, uh, who knows what we can do. And certainly uh, taking our computing technology and things like that uh, back to the continent, you know, could really be, uh, you know, pretty exciting. Uh, my daughter is uh, is like really brilliant. She, you know, she's getting ready to go back to law school and things like that. So, you know, I'm hoping that uh, we'll be able to build something that she can that she can carry forward. So, you know, 400 years from now, you're gonna see, you know, something with Derek Bailey's name on it out there. Uh, so every day I'm going hard. I'm talking business bank accounts and credit cards, and somehow we defeat the odds and making sure that no one starves illegal. All you had to do.